Good morning. So today, Netflix is operating in more than 190 different countries, and we have over 150 million uh, paid members globally. Uh, what contribute to our growth today is that we offer a wide range of high quality content, especially our original shows that's only on Netflix. And we make sure they're encoded with the best possible quality, and we deliver them to our member who is the best possible end-to-end uh, -end experience. And no matter in what country they are, on what kind of device they're on, or what network they're on. So a few years back, when we start to embark on this journey, we start asking us a number of questions. For example, how will Netflix members rate the visual quality of this video? Is it poor, average, or excellent? Which video clips looks better encoded with a codec A or codec B? For this particular episode, at 1,000 kbps, is it better for us to encode it with HD resolution with a slightly blockiness, or is it better to encode it with SD? So what we found is that um, we cannot just answer those questions with uh, golden eyes or expert viewing, because if you look at uh, the very large ca catalog of content that we have and all the different varieties of encoding recipes we have, it's simply not scalable enough. We could also opt for uh, automated objective metrics like PSNR or SSIM. But we found is that they're also fall, fell short in terms of capturing the perceptual quality of our end viewers. So what we need is a better perceptual metric that could do an accurate measure of a human perception of uh, video quality. It needs to be consistent across different content, no matter it is the animation or it's an action movie. And because we want it to be run at scale in our cloud infrastructure, it needs to be reasonably computationally efficient. And, but the most important is that because we're operating with uh, uh, HTTP adaptive streaming, the most important two types of artifacts, this uh, metric should be capturing our compression artifacts as well as scalable, uh, scaling artifacts. And our answer at the end of the day is then we offer VMAF, Video Multi-Method Assessment Fusion, which is a, a video quality metric that combines uh, machine learning with human vision system modeling. Today I'm gonna take you on a journey of VMAF. Uh, my name is Zee Li, I work at Encoding Technology at Netflix. So I you give a, a number of talks with the same um, title, but each time I'm going to try to slightly tailor its content for the audience. And depending on the recent progress we have, we also have some new uh, um, reporting of the working in progress. So in this talk, I'm going to first give you a brief history of VMAF. Um, and then we're going to help you to dive a little bit deep into the technical aspect to explain the underlying principles of how it works. And lastly, I'm going to report you a number of uh, work in progress uh, to give you a flavor of what we've been doing uh, at Netflix. So this project it, uh, really started as a research collaboration with Professor Jay Kuo's lab in USC. His research group has been working on this uh, image quality assessment for a while, and we figured it's a good joint effort for us to apply some of the principles and specifically for video content. And over about a year, we have our first VMAP version in, running in production. And then we start reaching out to even more research collaborators, including Professor Patrick Lecalet from University of Nantes of France, um, Al Bovic from UT Austin. Both of them are world uh, renowned expert in this particular domain. Um, later in 2015, we have our first uh, public showing at ICIP as an industrial invitation paper. Um, in the middle of 2016, VMAP went live as an open source project on GitHub, and we also published our first uh, VMAP tech blog. In 2017, 
we have our first major algorithm revision uh, to bump up the version to 0.6.1. And we also add a phone model which is more well suited for uh, mobile cellular phone uh, viewing conditions. With the help of the uh, FFmpeg community, we have packaged the VMAP in the library and it's being used by FFmpeg as a filter. So from then on, the use of VMAP is more convenient when it's being used together with FFmpeg. In early 2018, we have our first VMAP enabled video optimization framework running in production at Netflix. We're generating VMAP optimized uh, video streams. And we performed speed optimization and we added a 4K model and also quantified the VMAP confidence interval to make it a better in terms of uh, uh, quantifying the accuracy of its performance. And we continue doing this uh, uh, speed optimization. In 2019, we have a second round of uh, speed optimization to reduce uh, the running speed, uh, the running time by 40%. The VMAF open source project is live in the middle of 2016. So in this package, we have offered uh, an efficiency implementation of the core algorithm, but we also offer tools in Python for any user of this tool to train his or her own model depending on the specific scenario uh, they want to your video enc uh, encoder to operate in. For example, what kind of content might be different from the Netflix case, you could uh, tailor your training train model to, for that purpose. And since then, uh, over the past three years, we have seen uh, organic growth of, of uh, our users of the open source uh, tools. And we have, up to now, we have over 1,000 stars on GitHub. And what's important is that we have an active community of contributors to the open source project. VMAP has been integrated a number of third party tools, including FFmpeg, Moscow State University video quality measurement tools, video clarity tools, as well as Alicard video quality estimator. Uh, to, to illustrate how you can use VMAP, um, th this is a uh, first example I want to give. You can use VMAP for coded comparison purposes. So in this particular example, in the last uh, um, JVET meeting in Gothenburg, uh, Sweden, um, there has been a study on what's the coding gain of EVC compared to HEVC. So three methodology has been adopted, PSNR, VMAP, SS, well as the subjective viewing test. So in each of the case, it basically construct the rate quality curve and you can compute uh, the bit rate savings by doing the uh, BD rate calculation. As you can see here, um, if you compare the different predictions um, for the HD and UHD uh, cases, actually using VMAP is pretty close to what uh, the subjective test to give you the MOS score. And PSNR, on the other hand, is giving a roughly more uh, conservative prediction because part of the reason is it, do it doesn't entirely capture the perceptual advantage of the VEC codec. The second use case I'm going to introduce you here is you can use VMAP to optimize your encoding decisions. Dynamic Optimizer has been the framework we have been using at Netflix to produce uh, the VMAP optimized streams. Essentially, what it does to find the best encoding paths that give you the best average VMAP or for a given bit rate. And our study shows that there is substantial gain that you can achieve by doing this type of optimization on top of the more advanced the codec you can switch to. In other words, better codec and more smart optimization could uh, give you additional gain in terms of video quality. Or given the same video quality, uh, more efficient re reduction of video bit rate. So going to the second part of the talk, I'm going to give you a 10,000 foot view of how the VMAP works by highlighting some of the underlying principles. So before that, I'm gonna show you some 
um, video clips, sorry, uh, screenshots of videos. And this is going to help you to develop some intuitions on how VMAP predicts the video quality compared to what the PSNR does. So I'm going to show you the clips uh, or the screenshots in pairs. For the first pair, I'm going to show you first is from the origins of new black, a very bright beach scene. And this is compared against the Breaking Bad, very, very dark scene. And for those two uh, screenshots you can see in terms of PSNR, they're quite different. But uh, in terms of VMAF, VMAF is giving you the prediction that the visual quality should look similar among those two shots. So you can get a sense of the similarity between uh, the quality between those two screenshots. And here is a second pair of videos. The first one is from Avengers, um, and the second is from uh, animation title Archer. Uh, in both cases, the uh, PSNR value is around 29 dB, which is fairly low. Um, in terms of VMAF, the first is uh, give you the VMAF of 20 out of 100, and the second is about 69. So VMAP predicts the quality is uh, dramatically different compared against, uh, against each other, but uh, in terms of PSNR, uh, they're quite similar. So you can try to get some sense of which prediction is more accurate. So going to the overall framework for VMAP, essentially you can think it as a two-stage process. For the third, first step, basically the spatial features and the temporal feature has been extracted over a pixel neighborhood of each individual video frames. And we're doing this by calculating all the elementary metrics that's important. So for example, VIF and DLM. VIF stands for Visual Information Fidelity. DLM is a detail loss metric. For the temporal feature, we basically just use a Gaussian filter, the frame differences. So we're doing a temporal averaging, special averaging over entire frame to get some prediction uh, in each of those metrics. And these um, features offer you the basic evidence of perceptual quality of the content. Um, if you think it as a, in a higher level, basically what this step is doing, the human vision system modeling, basically you're simulating the low level uh, neural circuits of the human eye. To give you a more concrete example, con contrast masking is a predominant effect of the human vision system. What it basically says is when you have a compression or scaling artifacts getting superimposed on the pristine source signal with similar frequency or orientation, the artifacts becomes less noticeable by the human eye. So for example, on the picture on the right, this illustrates two areas. So in the woods area, essentially has a higher contrast in terms of the pristine content. In this case, it provides a better mask to the quantization or scaling artifacts that we're going to be introducing into this, uh, that we could introduce into this image. Um, on the other hand, um, the water surface is very smooth, very low contrast. So any uh, compression artifacts introduced here could be much more easily noticed by the human eye. So we collect all those uh, um, psychovisual evidences about the visual quality, and the second step, what we do is to use apply a machine learning algorithm to align those basic features with subjective scores. And do, we do that through SVM, support vector machine regression. Um, but first of all, we need to collect subjective data in order to train the model. So we do this through a lab test. And on this picture, you can see it's our collaborator from University of Nantes in a typical lab setup. So the lighting condition has been properly set up and the viewer is viewing from a standard viewing distance for the HD content. And after viewing of each of the video clips, he has to vote on the scale of absolute category rating scale, ACR. Um, so on the scale of five, 
from bad, poor, fair, good, or excellent. So once we have collected all those uh, uh, subjective scores, we try to map them into the VMAP scale. So roughly speaking, uh, the bad quality is mapped to VMAP score 20, and the excellent quality is mapped to 100. So as a result, the trained model maintains this kind of scale, and you can interpret VMAP score uh, by imagining that you're under this lab test and this is your, your voting results. For example, you got a VMAP score of 80, essentially can be mapped into, under this lab condition, it, the viewer will rate it with a good, uh, as having good quality. And of course, the viewing distance and screen size matters. To, to illustrate this, I'm showing uh, the same screenshots uh, on the different uh, size uh, of canvas displayed. As you can see, the big canvas uh, image, you can find that uh, this has pretty apparent coding artifacts. But for the same uh, image displayed on the smaller canvas, uh, the coding artifacts becomes much less noticeable. And this uh, smaller canvas actually represents the ca typical case where the viewer votes, uh, views on the cellular phone. Um, so having that in mind, we actually collect subject data and train a model to specifically apply to the phone viewing case. And here is one example of the same video applying two scores um, with uh, increasing bit rate. And so what uh, this uh, plot shows you is there are two trends. The first trend is uh, um, the VMAP phone score tends to predict that the viewer will perceive the video as having higher quality uh, when it's being viewed on the cellular, uh, cellular phone mobile screen. The second trend is that if you look at uh, how uh, the green curve flattening out for 720 and 1080 points, essentially there is very vanishing differences between those points if there is any such difference. Now come to the third part of this talk. I'm gonna give you some highlight of a different ongoing uh, directions that we've been pursuing in terms of uh, improving VMAP as well as how, where we can apply the VMAP metrics. The first is about HDR. So today more and more source content, especially uh, Netflix originals, has been shot and ingested in HDR format into our encoding pipeline. So together with uh, HDR device capabilities, they, they could deliver superior experience to Netflix members. The question is how do we capture the perceptual quality advantages achieved by this content and the device the content is being displayed on? For example, showing here is one particular content which has a maximum luminance value of 3,000 nits. And we know that in a typical commercial display, a commercial HDR UHD TV today supports around 1,000 nits. So the question we ask is, what is the source content? When this source content is displayed on this display, how much better does it look compared to a SDR TV? So our goal is to capture the perceptual benefit of HDR videos over SDR, and more generally, we would like to extend the quality prediction of VMAF to, to the uh, HDR region. However, uh, there are challenges, right? The first challenge is that if you consider device physical characteristics, you can think of it as uh, there are multi multiple dimensions. It is actually very challenging for us to develop a model that could reflect every single dimension of the device. And it might simply sometimes having too many parameters. So what we need to do is to capture the uh, dimensions that's most uh, relevant to the perceptual quality. So according to Adobe study, so maximum luminance seems to be the f having the first order effects followed by the backlight resolution and the, the minimum luminance and et cetera. So, in this final model we're gonna develop, the hope is that we're gonna be capturing as many 
as uh, dimensions, but in a, in a cost-effective way. Um, the second challenge is that we, we need a new human vision system to extend beyond SDR. The current model that we have been incorporating into the current VMAP model are, works pretty well in the SDR region, but if we extrapolate to the HDR, it, it might be not as accurate. So uh, additional research into what additional uh, HDR features need to, needs to be incorporated, uh, that's uh, one of uh, our uh, ongoing work. And this model also needs to deal with complex interactions between luminance and compression artifacts, right? So if you think about compression artifacts, when the video is being showing under different luminance conditions, sometimes you, you're lighting it up or your display uh, the artifacts might become more noticeable. And these are the effects that needs to be captured in this model as well. So this is a work in progress, and our uh, goal is that we be able to develop a model that we can eventually open source and share with the community. Now it comes to the second um, um, topic, which is um, to use VMAF in a QOE diagnosis uh, procedure. So we receive uh, complaints from our users about our quality, right? Um, sometimes it can be rebuffering events. Sometimes the, the, con uh, the encode seems to be too pixelated um, and looks pretty bad. Um, so if we want to dig into this QOE, the challenge is that there are multiple factors that would uh, impact the final QE that the user has. For example, um, there is the ABR algorithm, and the encodes would also impact uh, the final result, and also the network condition, right? Giving a bad QE experience, how do you know which of the is the contributing factor that's uh, making the uh, viewer particular session to be really bad? So we developed this framework, which we call hindsight, and we use this framework to evaluate an ABR algorithm. So what we can do here is giving a certain encoding ladder, and also the measure network throughput. We will be able to retrospectively calculate what's the optimum decision we can make over a session. And we can compare them against a production selection that we have, um, and we can compare how much gap there is between those two versions in terms of the overall quality that's being achieved over a session. If the gap is small, then we can conclude that pretty confidently that this ABR algorithm is doing the right thing, and we can further triage the problem and look into either the network or the encoding. But if the gap is large, um, there's something we can do about improving this uh, um, ABR algorithm in terms of operating in this particular session. And through a big data analysis, it, this allow us to identify trends over like millions of sessions, and we can target at the particular cluster of sessions that we can achieve the best gain uh, in terms of improving QOE um, while giving a limited resource, engineering effort we have. And now the third topic is about learned image compression. So learned image compression is just essentially is a topic of a, a new way of doing image or video uh, compression using deep neural networks. And this can be dated back um, over several decades, uh, but the recent wave really started in 2016. For example, this is a sample work done by Ballet. Um, so if you take a traditional uh, image uh, encoding framework, right? I think of the transform coding, right? Um, it has the building blocks that does the linear uh, transform of the signal, and then you do quantization, then you do entropy coding. And the idea here is that we can replace uh, this linear transform blocks with a nonlinear uh, neural network, convolutional neural networks and giving a certain loss function um, 
to capture the distortion end to end, we will be able to optimize uh, the encoder together with the decoder. And um, uh, typically we can use a loss function, for example, MSE, or equivalently using PSNR. But we can also use more advanced SSIM or multi-scale SS SSIM. However, if you're trying to apply VMAP here in the optimization framework, um, we will not be able to do it uh, in the most straightforward fashion because VMAP is not differentiable. And what we need is some differentiable uh, metrics that could help us to drive this back propagation decision. So what do we do? Uh, together with uh, our collaborators from UT Austin, um, we did this joint work of training a differentiable proxy, uh, the VMAP work network. So the idea is that uh, instead of using VMAP, we use a proxy VMAP to drive the decision making. So this framework has two stages, and we're running those two stages in an iterative fashion. In the first stage, we freeze the proxy VMAP network and trying to optimize the compression network. And the compression network will generate samples for us to, again, to train the VMAP network in the next stage. So in the next stage, we do the opposite. We freeze uh, the compression network and then we optimize for VMAP. And iteratively, this will allow us to actually drive uh, the compression decision to optimize for VMAP. For example, here is one uh, particular case where we can compare uh, a VMAP driven uh, optimization network with a baseline which is driven by MSE. You can see there is pretty uniform gain in all uh, bit rate regions. If you compare um, the blue curve uh, with uh, the purple curve, and we even see for some regions, we can see this, uh, um, the VMAP proxy network even outperform HEVC intro or uh, JPEG 2000s. So it's very promising. So with this, with this, I would like to open up for questions. Hey, um, thank you. Um, a round of applause, please. Okay, are there any questions in the audience? Please raise your hand. Okay. So, quick question on forward-looking VMAF. I think one of the, the notes in, in the VMAF open source repository is both about not um, knowing the best temporal pooling algorithms um, or means and um, as well as looking for more sophisticated motion metrics. Um, is that something you guys are actively working on now? Um, yes, those improvements has been on, on our roadmap. Uh, it's just we don't have a dedicated uh, a timeline for how this new feature is going to be rolling out, but it's in the pipe, uh, it's in the roadmap. Okay, other questions in the audience? Please raise your hand. Hi, uh, my question is about the classifier. I think you mentioned you are using a support vector machine. Uh, any particular reason for SVM versus a neural network? Um, so we just find this uh, support vector machine uh, case works pretty well. And we haven't tried uh, neural networks yet, but uh, it's in the future work. Okay, I'm bringing the mic up. I, can you say something about the compute effort of this metric and does it scale? You mean the neural network based? Yeah, the, the VMAF uh, qualification, is it, give us some number. How tough is that for compute? Wait, sorry, can you? Uh, like which? Um, what is the compute effort needed to um, estimate VMAF score? Um, if you can in, give in general. In general, if you can give a number. Um, so for 
the current uh, implementation we have in the open source, uh, you can run VMAP in real time on the 1080p video. And so that's uh, roughly um, more than uh, 24 FPS. And for, um, for UHD video 4K, it's a little bit less than um, um, the real time. But there are tricks you can do. For example, we have the feature of you can skip frames. You, so computer VMAP on every alternative frames would allow uh, you to speed up. So would you say that the model you distribute with lib lib VMAP for FFmpeg is highly tuned only for Netflix-specific content, or is it generally tuned for any type of content? Because if you look at sports content, it's quite different than the content you distribute. So would, would VMAP still apply in that case with the model that you supply? Right, so the, the model we have published are all being optimized with respect to Netflix content. Um, um, but in, if you think about the kinds of uh, uh, compression artifacts, it's probably going to be similar, but not the same content, though. So you, you are op you're free to train any of the model, giving a particular cat, uh, genre of content. OK, we'll take one more question. And if I can ask the next speaker to get ready, that would be good. Hi, uh, I was wondering uh, if in addition to the uh, perceptual studies, uh, the user studies that you did, uh, if you were able to do any studies on Netflix users and uh, you know feedback that they might have given on different, uh, different bit rates and how they sort of correlated the uh, real world field versus the uh, experimental setup? That's a good question. So we, we haven't been able to do that. Yeah, it's so like, um, how would you end up doing that? Maybe you have to offer a, a kind of a survey after each of streaming session. But um, I, I think if it's not under a controlled lab environment, where there could be many confounding factors affecting viewers' uh, decision, uh, uh, perception of the quality, right? Uh, how attentive a viewer is watching that video uh, compared to, are they confusing the video quality compared to the, the content, if you don't, don't like the content, what do they? Uh, so those are all the confounding factors. Something about a survey. Um, right, yeah, that also will affect the results. Okay, um, that's, that's all the questions. Uh, I'd like to give another round of applause.